take the right door on your way down. There's no telling where you'll end up. Can you make it through? To the night's end. Dip through time is always fun. Three stories down, two to go. I bet you're getting a little excited about leaving this place. You have no idea, mate. I was a master in my own right before you took that away from me. I'm very keen to go and see my family. Ah, yes. Your family. Tragic. Don't worry, Jimmy. I hold no hard feelings over my incarceration. It's actually given me time to reflect and plan. Good. Because the last thing I need is another enemy. It's not been long since I got rid of the last one. (laughs) Okay. On to the next one. A little one closer to my own family. Parameters of Oblivion Written by Angela Meyer Narrated by Sarah Jane Justice I rise at dusk and watch kangaroos nibble at the edges of the property. They sometimes spring upright, hearing or sensing my presence, and stare through the window to where I sit, waiting for complete darkness. This valley is remote, but not quiet. In the semi-dark, cows bray, flocks of black cockatoos scream across the sky and ravens caw. And the hoon with the zooped-up Holden takes off fast to the pub with music blaring. Once, there were also voices inside the house. My parents, and then my husband, my child. They say the missing will fade over time. My daughter Amy plays by the light of the TV in my ex-husband's house. If she were to look out into the yard towards me, She might spot a tiny bent wing bat hanging in the tree. She never does. Amy's doll's leg has popped out of its socket and she goes to my husband's girlfriend to ask for help. I used to try to demonstrate to her how it can be fixed and then I would hand the toy back and let her do it herself. I thought this was a better way to learn and to make sure children weren't reliant on you. But the girlfriend takes the leg and swivels the socket back into the body hole and smiles at Amy sweetly and Amy takes it without saying thanks. There's a new addition to the house in the back room that looks over the garden. My husband's mother in a hospital bed. She smells different to the others. She has a little pump near her pillow, feeding chemicals into her body via a butterfly clip at her shoulder. Matthew now spends a lot of time in this room, on the chaise we used to have on our veranda up the mountain. I let him have everything when we broke up, knowing I was turning into what I am now. I had to pretend I didn't want anything of them in my life anymore. I told them about my lover, Lucia, as a way to make them more disgusted with me, to rush things along. I broke Matthew's heart. I alternate on different nights between the house of my former family and my former lover. Lucia's house is the same now as it always was. The mismatched ceramics and plants crowding countertops, the chrome and vintage, the velvet lounge and piles of New Yorker magazines on a dusty coffee table. She seems as timeless as I am, though I have some naivete, no doubt, about how I will comprehend her withering. I'd considered continuing to see her, but 
knew it would raise too many questions later on. We are better suited to dating within our own kind, apparently. And it's frowned upon to turn a human to be your companion, your bride. There's no guarantee that they'll be grateful. I only see Lucia with wine these days, but I remember how she would make her coffee. In the French press, heaped tablespoons of Vittoria, one each and one for the pot, a viscous, bitter metallic, close to blood. Matthew is reading to his mother as inoffensive, calm music plays on the small television tilted towards her bed. I only met her a few times as she wasn't an involved grandmother. She preferred cruises and theatre. But it seems duty is duty for Matthew, her eldest child. He did always step up in ways like that. Amy comes into the room and sits on Matthew's lap. I strain to remember the feel of her little legs. We shouldn't take brides, but what of children? I made her once, after all, did I not? I need to call David. He's not my maker, but is who I've been paired with from the guild. Kind of like a, an AA sponsor for vampires. I'm sure he'll tell me what to do with these desires. The old lady wakes up. She looks distressed. Matthew goes tied across the jaw and shoulders. Hello, Grandma. Amy says. Hello, little. Says Grandma, blurrily. I don't know where I am. Mum. Matthew says, reaching a hand gently forward to touch her. You're at my house. You're not well, remember? Her face crumples. She starts to shift about in the bed, seeming to have sudden strength beyond her tiny, pale frame. Were the others here? Amy, do you mind giving Grandma and I a moment? Matthew says. Amy departs, staring all the while. Matthew tries to explain to his mother her predicament. I can hear the breaking in his voice. She gets restless, frustrated. She pulls the sheets up and down, asks Matthew to turn the music off. Mum, I'm going to have to give you something to calm you down. And then, the old lady looks out the window to my branch and her eyes go wide. Why is Nicole in the tree? Matthew glances out towards me. I freeze. How could she see me? Or was it just a coincidence that her delirium brought me up? Matthew busies himself by her bed pulling an already drawn-out needle from a container. This is just a calming one, Mum. She doesn't say anything and continues to stare at me, confused. I begin to feel I am losing hold on my form. I am expanding. I don't understand. I scramble down from the tree with spiny half-wing arms and get as far away from the window as possible. In the corner of the garden, I stretch and unfold to my humanoid form, ending up curled in a ball. Thankfully, there's some of the girlfriend's clothes on the line. I can hear the old lady still saying my name and Matthew trying to calm her. This'll kick in soon, Mum. It's not long now. The lights are still on. I can't wait too long because without wings, I'll have to get back up the mountain on foot. I have no luck getting a cab to go up there and Uber definitely doesn't have the range. On the line is a pair of track pants and a faded grey hoodie. I'm surprised Matthew is with someone who wears clothes like this, but then I think he did always find me a bit uptight. But seriously, what's wrong with black stretch jeans and a cashmere knit? Just as comfy. There's no excuse. My options now are limited. I pull down the items as stealthily as possible and put them on in the dark corner of the yard. There are some Adidas scuffs by the back door. I crawl to them and slip them reluctantly on my feet, shimmy to the back gate, stand and sigh and walk out. Even with my enhanced speed and strength, it's a 40 kilometer walk and I'm going to have to make haste. Hopefully I'll find a snack along the way. I call David, my mentor, once I've made it past town and am winding up the mountain. I can hear cars from far enough away and can duck into the foliage at the side of the road. 
but I hate how much it slows my progress. If I don't get back to my cellar before the sky turns orange, I'll curl up like eucalyptus leaves in a bushfire. I'll never see Matthew, Amy, or Lucia ever again. David picks up. Nicole? David. What's up? I turned unwillingly back from microbat to human. David lives two hours away, so isn't going to be able to pick me up. But I need some answers. What were you doing? Staring in the eyes of a dying old lady. Ah. He says. Yeah, I can't believe I've forgotten to tell you about this. What? I'm sorry. It's just so much to know, you know? There sure has been. The expected. Sunlight, mirrors, silver. The grief. And the unexpected, like the endowment and the guild. Sort of like a vampire Centrelink and job network. And the way drinking blood feels much better than satiating hunger. More like a coke high or sex. That cockiness and forward motion thinking. In fact, it's better to be just a little bit hungry when I go see my family because it helps me remember the old ways of feeling. So the dying comprehend us differently. They see through our shapeshifts and glamours because they're called between realms. Sounds like the old lady doesn't have much time left. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that could have gone really fucking wrong, mate. Where were you? You don't hang around hospitals or something. I try to think of an excuse. Of course not. They stink. It was just a house I was passing by. Going suburban? Don't you have an abundance of food up there? Don't you wonder? For some variety? No, I don't, actually. In my experience, vamps usually settle into a pattern, a grid, like a hawk quartering nearby fields for food and coming back to the nest. It's good to have some parameters so you understand your environment and don't get caught out. Yeah. Well, I went a little further afield. It was just one night. He sighs. Well, be careful. I am, I say. Anything else I can help you with tonight, Nicole? Am I disturbing your parameters? No. You know, the guild matched us for a reason. You can be open with me. I don't know why the guild matched us. I find him authoritative, but not intimidating. He attracts and repulses me in equal parts. But I feel that way about most vampires I've come across. I think about asking him about brides and children. He already told me I'd need years of adjustment before I could make any kind of decision with a clear head. But by then, my old life child won't be a child anymore. And my lover will have withered. And now I know what he bloody well told me, but... There's nothing else, David. Thank you. For the whole conversation, my feet have been zigzagging, zooming me around the bends of the road. David would not have been able to tell how far away I was from home or how much I'd been rushing because a vampire doesn't get puffed because we have no breath. As such, though the outside air comes in and out of us and we can control it if we need to, for effect. But we still have muscles and... We still have blood, and I can feel the effort of it, and the gnawing hunger I can't attend to with the time ticking, ticking down. It is interesting, in a way, to notice time is finite again, when I've been trying to get used to the way it now stretches out, infinitely. I round the bend of the final stretch of road as the pink comes in at the horizon. I'm at the edge of the valley now, and way too exposed. I have no choice but to continue to go as superhumanly fast as possible and hope no one will be out yet milking their cows. The cacophony of birds starts up and if I could sweat, I would be sweating now. I fear attempting to sleep while so lean and empty, but I can't stop for food. I can't. I'm so close and the sun edges the darkness. The light creeps. I rush, I fly across the land. I make it to the door and through and down and into the cool, dark cellar, and I collapse. The hoon wakes me, revving their car for the night out. 
I am enraged to be woken by this and not the birds and the cicadas. I dart upright in the darkness, glance at the digital clock and then unlatch and push at the heavy metal door in the roof of the cellar and climb out. I'm still in last night's clothes and that makes me mad too. To not have had time to change into my comfortable silk pyjamas. That would account for some of the insomnia, though maybe it was also the hunger. I change quickly, the hoon all the while revving their fucking holden. I put on black jeans, boots, a woolen turtleneck and a leather jacket. And instead of moving out into the field, I bolt over the fence dividing our properties and walk up to the idling car. I knock on the window and her startled, bland little face leaps back. She winds down the window, but doesn't turn off the car. What the fuck do you think you're doing? She asks. I train my ears around me to check, probably a bit too late, we aren't being watched. You're disturbing me, I say calmly. I gesture back at my house. It's a free country. She's yellow in the interior light. No fat on her, but oh, so much blood. I see those veins pulsing at her tight temples, her taut neck. My fangs protrude and scratch at my lower lip. The longing takes over my body, hot and thick. What the fuck are you staring at? Get out of my yard. I see the wet, pink insides of her mouth as she yells at me. She goes to wind the window back up, but I put my hands over it, holding it open. She blanches at my strength. Turn the car off, I say, desire thickening my speech. She does so, confused. The evening's final flock of black cockatoos screams across the sky. I watched The Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price for the umpteenth time. I'm trying to justify what I've done. Trying to think of it as an inevitability. In the film, there is no stopping this plague. I try not to wish it could have been Amy, someone I love, someone familiar, so they could now be here and be mine. The fact that I wish that is the worst shame of all. David shows up around 11. I'd considered just cleaning up the scene and hoping for the best, but it's been enforced in me how hard the guild has worked to protect itself, to protect all of us, and that if I were to ruin it, it would be like ratting on the mafia or something. I'd be forever dead. So I'd called him. I open the door and he walks in and looks at my face and his lip actually starts to tremble. A human? Yes, I say. He sits down on the couch, hunched over in his bomber jacket, running a hand through his dark hair with its widow's peak echoing that of the great Vincent Price. He puts both his hands over his face and moans a little bit. I'm sorry. He looks up at me. How did it feel? I sit next to him, close, and he licks his lips, stays looking down, waiting for me to describe it. Like I was filled with light, like I was born and died again in the space of seconds, seeing all the universe from the inside out, like I was atom and star. He turns and grasps my arm. He looks sorry, goes to let go, but I want it too. I nod. I grasp back. He pushes me down on the couch. He sniffs my face. I'm the devil. I can smell her on you. He says. I'm still filled with light. I unzip my pants and wriggle them down. 
He leans back and removes his shirt, unzips his jeans. I touch his cold, cold skin. There's a hint of that repulsion, but it's a knife's edge from wanting. I close my eyes as he licks my lips and enters me. I am wet and alive after my feeding. A shiver ripples through him. I wrap my legs and arms around his body. I sit on the back step, looking out over the valley. The night is cloudless, moonless, dark. The longer I look at the stars, the more of them I see, as though I'm willing them into being. I hear the screen door open and close behind me, and David comes out, sighing. I blink, and stars fade. Look, I have to take her in, he says, standing over me. My gut twists with loss and suspicion. They're going to come for me. He rubs his hand across his face. I don't know yet. They're not happy. But they'll look into, you know, how to make her disappear in a realistic way. I can contribute some ideas. You don't need to do that. David sits down beside me. I used to love to sit like this on the edge of a veranda with a tinny and a smoke. What was your poison? I ask. Well, it was Forex. I died in the 80s. In Queensland, presumably. Yep. So you missed the whole craft beer explosion. David wrinkles up his face and I laugh. I'd been more of a Pinot Noir or single malt kind of girl, but I don't bother going there. David, I venture... You've mentioned to me before that we become more disinterested over time. As in, we won't think about our former loved one. Yes. How long does it take? David stares into me, no doubt seeing more than I want to give away. You just have to trust it will happen. And distract yourself in the meantime. Well... Not by feeding on your neighbours. He puts his head in his hands... You're envious of me, I say. Yeah, you reckon? He says pointedly. It's been decades for me. I thought we didn't miss anything. Only blood. Always blood. My child is my blood. David eventually gets up. I better take her now, considering the time. I nod. I'll stay out here. Righto. Talk soon, mate. He says. I keep my eyes averted as he drags the girl, still half alive, through the house, out the front door into his car boot. The car starts up and drives off. And then, silence. The deep of the night, silence. The worst time. I know there will be consequences for what I've done, but really, what else could they take away from me? I remember building this house with Matthew, for us and my aging parents. We were digging out the cellar and after that first deep hole was dug, I looked at it and thought it was like digging a grave. Cutting the spade into the grass and the dark soil, creating an absence. I don't believe David. Don't believe them all and what they tell themselves about the distancing. I look up at the stars, concentrating watching them blink on, silent and distant. That is the place my other dead went, my parents. I never stopped missing them. Years later, prompted by a photo or object, I could be thrown back instantly to the raw grief of those early days. The vampire's loneliness is probably something like that. It doesn't ever go away, but you adapt to it, learn to live with it and carry it. It becomes a part of you. I knock on Lucia's door. I'm wearing a blue velvet suit, 
I've slicked back the front of my hair, Nick Cave-like. It's 9pm. I should have texted first, but I was worried she wouldn't reply. We do catch each other late at night with an electronic missive sometimes. But I've kept my distance until now. I'm emboldened tonight. Or desperate. She opens the door, smelling of sage and parsley seed. One of her expensive creams. Her eyes are brown and flecked with gold and deep and alive. Nicole? What the fuck? I put my hands up, submissive and unthreatening, and hot, surely hot as hell with this hair and this suit hugging my curves and the unnatural glow of my skin after having fed. Can we just talk a little bit? I thought you said we could never see each other again. She makes a block between the half-open door and the arch. You have someone here? No, and I like it that way. We did always share that penchant for introversion. Couples who share that can be so comfortable together. Quiet, headphone clad, reaching a hand out every now and then to touch. A presence, but not an interference in each other's thoughts. In the same way, it had been amazing to have a sleeping child with a little head resting on my lap. Connected, affectionate, soothing quiet. Are you okay? She says. Hmm. I tilt my head. One of our biggest issues had been the way I burdened her, in a sense, with every emotion I couldn't express at home. I never felt good about it, but I couldn't stop myself. I never went to therapy. I didn't want someone kicking around in my head, dredging up things about my mother's breast milk running out or something. She was very patient. She is patient. She hasn't, for example, slammed the door in my face. You can come in for one drink, okay? She unblocks the doorway, shows me the light of the hall. She's wearing her favourite hippie tights and a layered singlet that shows off her collarbones and the muscles of her arms and shoulders. She's both hard and soft, a bisexual dream. Whiskey? She asks as we walk into the lounge room. Sure, I say. Not much. I don't really drink anymore. She laughs out loud. (laughs) I suppose it is pretty implausible. She hands me a neat single malt in a Glen Cairn glass and sits across from me, crossing her legs. I see the blood pulsing in her barefoot soul. I know I shouldn't reach out to you anymore. I can't seem to control my impulses. You never could. Yeah, well, nobody's perfect. I feign a sip of whiskey. I was always able to be honest with you. To talk about my desires. It's hard now. When you break up with someone, I mean. It's hard that where there was once intimacy... There's distance. Yeah. Like even the way you're sitting there, blocking me, legs crossed, all hard in your posture, like I haven't known you. She sighs and shakes her head. (sighs) You sound about 15 years old. But I never did get used to how things change after they end. You did always struggle with that. She says, more soft. That's why you never left him for me. She looks down into her own old hurts. I stare. I feed on the sight of her. I can't do this again. I have to go, I say, and I see the flicker on her face of disappointment. Well, that is certainly not like you, to not linger, she says. Everything has changed for me, more than I can explain. Is that what you came to say? I came to say that I will always love you. I hold her gaze. I don't think I said goodbye properly last time. 
You sound like you're going to die. I'm not, I say quickly. And I'm not trying to get you to feel sorry for me or anything. It's just that for a while I was still trying in my head to think of how I could make this work. But I'm different now. She looks at my face. I can tell. You look... haunted. Do you want to talk about it? We both pause, smirk a little. It's an old pattern. Suddenly we're intimate again, familiar despite it all. No, I say simply. I take her hand, knowing she'll flinch from how cold mine is. She does, but I hold her eyes. Goodbye, Lulu. Find someone who treats you nice. Tears fill her eyes. Good to know she's not over me too. But I won't be back. The next night I see one of the guild's black sedans pull up at the house next door. A woman gets out of the driver's seat. I recognise her from my initiation. Stunning, wears boiler suits. She directs a couple of lackeys to go into the house and then she walks over to the fence towards my place. I better go out to meet her. Evening, I say, sliding back the glass door. Hello, Nicole. She says, frowning. We stare at each other. Samar, isn't it? What's the punishment? I ask. I'm half in, half out the door. It's a blue night. Low sliver moon. Let's start with this. She holds up a USB. I let her inside and she walks straight to my laptop on the kitchen bench. I lean forward and enter my password and she puts in the stick. She opens a video, filmed at the local guild bunker, which I recognise because it's where I woke up between one life and the next. In the video, the hoon is howling and writhing about in a sparse room, blood dripping into her via an IV. Samar points to the equipment. Your blood. What? I say. She's your responsibility now. It's painful to watch the hoon thrashing about because of the sense memory of my own turning. Samar knows this. She also knows I must not have liked the hoon if I attacked her. So it's a fitting punishment to make her attached to me. Aren't you worried about there being two vampires up here? On the contrary. Since you've been here, we've taken a bit of interest in the place. During the floods, when those landslides cut off the road, we realised just how valuable it might be to us. Plentiful food... She gestures out towards the valley. Minimal possible witnesses to our activities... I'm feeling nauseous. It's my home, where I lived with my family. It's the place of my grief and remembrance, not a vampire's paradise. Maybe this is all part of the punishment. She gives me a sharp look. I thought you were one of those vamps who was taking a while to... She stops, as though she's trying to find the words. Rolls her hand on her wrist. Need less company. Human company, I think. Not blood-sucking strangers. I need to have room for my thoughts. If this becomes a vampire village, it'll be my eternal nightmare. It'll be a town of creatures just like myself. I don't respond. She pulls out the USB, closes my laptop for me. She needs another couple of days, and then we'll release her. You have a spare room, right? What's wrong with her place? She's too unpredictable. You remember what it's like. We'll have a couple of operatives over there in case you need help. They'll continue working on the glamour profile for the neighbourhood and on the people in her life. I nod. The true horror of what I've done edges in on those last couple of words. Her family, her friends, the people she hangs out with at the pub... Her parents, 
siblings. Who knows? I'm sure I'll find out about them. Every detail. Please, please, I think. Don't have any children. Samar goes out the sliding door and my body twists with its disgusting hunger. I slip out the back door and down into the valley for a feed. It's been three days of the guild fart assing around next door and scoping out the town. I run into a short guy who looks like Danny DeVito out in the field and successfully beat him to a large marsupial. This is my territory. Doesn't their idea go against everything they've been drumming into me? That I have to become used to all the all-encompassing loneliness? The detachments will fade and cease to matter? I can't go to town with them here either. Can't check on Amy and see how she's coping with her grandma dying. And then they bring back the hoon. She stands at my screen door with that snarly face she had even before fangs. I don't want to face her anger, her sadness, her grief. But of course I can get up to let her in. Time to get the worst of it over with. Uh, hi, I say. Come in. I guess they've filled you in? Yeah, mate. You suck with me. She says, scratching the inside of her arm. Some old habit. She's shorter than me. Really skinny. Thin, mousy hair with split ends. They've at least given her an outfit that seems to fit. A plain black t-shirt and blue jeans. I'm hungry. She says, looking up at me with childlike vulnerability. That's different. Where's the tough cunt from the other night? Uh, okay. Um, well, I'll take you out. Ruse are best. They'll keep you going all night. We go through the house and out into the backyard that leads down the valley. It's dark, but we can see fine. You've got to consciously tune into the vision, I say. And have you had a chance to shift yet? Into a bat? Yeah. That can help you find prey, of course being able to fly. I've had one go at it. Still scratching her arm. Okay, we'll start out skulking. You've got to avoid anywhere someone might see us. Don't go near any yards or even anywhere too exposed, yeah? She nods, looking out over the tall, whispering grasses. I'm still wondering why she hasn't torn me a new one. Rue! She says and shoots off at full speed. I follow, but let her take the kill. Watch as she devours it. Good job. Uh, what's your name, anyway? Jackie, she says, looking up, teeth full of blood. Her t-shirt is soaked. I forgot to tell her it's easier to hunt naked, but she probably feels vulnerable enough as it is. And I'm still a bit scarred myself from seeing Danny DeVito out here in the buff the other night. I crouch down next to Jackie. I'm rolling the word sorry around on my tongue. I can almost feel that old prick of tears. But her face is full of delight at the feed and I don't want to ruin the moment. This is sick, she says in the this is fucking awesome sense. I guess so, I say. Whatever. She may think different later. Once I've fed too and we're back inside, I feel cramped in. I just want to wallow the way I usually do, not have this awful stranger taking up space in my house. I show her around. This is a room you can make your own, I say. It's mine and Matthew's old room. Amy's old room is for me alone. But of course, you have to sleep in the cellar. In the cellar, I've made her a bed as far away as possible from my own. I show her that. So no coffins, she says. Some vamps find that cosy, but 
Really, as long as there's no light and we're under the earth, you'll sleep fine. She nods. So, I say, in the cold quiet of the cellar, I'm sorry I lost myself and bit you. She shakes her head at me. You have no idea how good for me this is. I reel. I was fucked on ice, man. I had no real friends or family anymore. That shit was going to kill me. And now I can live forever. She gives me a giant, grateful smile. It's the coolest thing ever. She rolls over and settles into her mattress as though it's a king-size canopy bed with full trimmings. I don't know what to think. The worst thing is that she is always here. Beside me in the damp valley grasses, on the couch at 4am watching movies, on the veranda daring to watch the first pink peak of sun. And I crab at her and tell her to leave me alone for a fucking second. And she laughs because all her life she had worse. I'm a kitten to her. I can't get away. There's no way of knowing whether she would rat me out and to take her with me would be too unpredictable. So I keep showing her the ropes despite being so green myself and sometimes David comes by and gives us a more wide-ranging lecture and Jackie is at least decent enough to notice there's a bit of something there and occupy herself for 20 minutes every other visit. The punishment is working. It doesn't matter what she says about how shit her life was. I see her suspended in youth and full of wasted potential, and the million possibilities that would have been of growth and happiness. And shit, what I had lost it over. A fucking car revving. I decide I need to work properly on what I haven't worked through. And damn these vamps, if they want to just tell me I'll forget about it all and become tough as petrified wood. One night, Jackie gorges herself just off dusk and gets sleepy again and goes back to bed. Love a good sleep in, she says, saluting me and entering the door to the cellar. This is my chance. I have to go a back way to bypass the guild operatives who settle in next door who'll recognise me even in bat form. I come out at the top of the village on the mountain road and then fly down to my family's house. I'll have to be careful the old lady doesn't spot me this time. But when I get there, I see the back room is empty of the hospital bed. A normal single bed has been reinstalled and everything in the room is clinically neat. I hang there for a long time before I'm ready to look in on my daughter. In Amy's room, Matthew's girlfriend is putting her to bed. She reads to her from a colourful book full of balloonish animals. Amy chuckles in the cutesy funny parts. At the end of the book, she asks the woman to read it again. If it were me, I would have said, time for sleep and put on her nightlight and left the room. But the girlfriend reads it two more times until Amy's eyes struggle to stay open. She falls asleep with a cosy smile on her face. I leave the tree and I fly, wings aching, back up the mountain. Three days later, a guild operative knocks on my door. I get off the lounge to answer it. Jackie stays, eyes fixed on Charmed. Evening, I say. Nicole? The man says. It's not the short one. This guy looks a bit like a human greyhound, barrel-chested, long-nosed. All the glamours are in place over there, and we've properly furnished the trench we dug out for sleeping. Jackie appears at my shoulder. I can go home. Yes. The long man says. I don't look at Jackie. What about the, the other business Samar mentioned? About the village? The man nods. You'll see us around. 
that's an idea we're pursuing. I imagine the little corner shop turned into an all-night cafe. Vamps hanging out by moonlight in the open, swapping carcasses and stories. No humans in danger. And a barrier, cut off from town. Jackie is twisting her pale hands together. Um... Yes? The man asks. She looks at me. What if... Can I stay here? I hold back the smile that wants to push onto my face. Whatever you want, mate. I say casually. The operative nods. We can keep using your place as a base then. He gives a salute. Two fingers like fangs from the mouth out to the air. Night, young bloods. We salute him back. You! Jackie yips, vamp zooming to the couch and jumping up and down on it. I let myself laugh. Let's go get a feed, I say. Jackie cracks the back door, and I follow her out to the yard. I look up and stare at the sky as the stars, one after another, wink on. You've been listening to The Dark Heart, which is a production of Dissonance Media. Parameters of Oblivion was written by Angela Meyer, who is an author, editor, and professional reader from Melbourne, Australia. The debut novel, A Superior Spectre, was published by Peter Bishop Books Ventura in Australia and Saraband in the UK. It has been shortlisted for five literary awards. To see more from Angela, head to literaryminded.com.au or click on any of the links in the show notes. Narration and Nicole was performed by Sarah Jane Justice. David was performed by Scott Davidson. Lucia was performed by Amy Coots. Samar was performed by Nina Nikolic. Jackie was performed by Jules from the J Experiment podcast. Matthew was performed by James Barnett. Security Man was performed by Brian Jeans. Grandma was performed by Jenny Barnett. Amy was performed by Ella. For any links to the voice talent, please check the show notes. This episode was produced and edited by James Barnett. If you'd like to support The Night's End or Dissonance Media, please head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Night's End podcast. There you'll receive early access to episodes and one exclusive episode every month. And as always, stay horrific, everyone. <laughs>